These aircraft are fitted with underwing hardpoints for the carriage of stores, in this case, their smoke generators. The Pilatus PC-7 is built in Switzerland, and nearly 400 of them have been sold to 12 nations. The team leader is Jacques Bottelin. The show is uh, 15 minutes, and uh, that's the show, so we have to catch the attention of the, of the public. And the first part is uh, aerobatic in close formation, then we split, make some crossings. The crossings are very impressive, I think, for the public, because uh, uh, the speed is uh, 200 knots of each aircraft, and uh, the distance is around, I would say, five or six meters maximum, yeah. and uh, that's very close. And um, all, then we join again and uh, try, as I told you, to make a real show and, and catch the attention of the public uh, as much as possible. What particular maneuver would you describe as being the highlight of the show? I think we have a special maneuver called Apache Roll. We have two aircraft uh, in that position, like yes. mirror, and the third one barreling around. That's very difficult for the synchronization of the speeds of the aircraft. And what I can tell also is that Apache was the name of my dog, and uh, that was the first name of my team. Uh, I had a, a dog flying aerobatics with me, <laughs> and uh, we, the, the name of the team came from the name of the dog. <laughs> oh, it's lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Jack, and good luck for the rest of the display season. Thank you very much. Sir Thomas Sopwith recently celebrated his 100th birthday, and this year Biggin Hill paid tribute to the great man. The breadth of his contribution is shown here with the tiny pup at full stretch being shadowed by the modern Harrier GR5. However, the name Sopwith is really synonymous with the First World War. The pup was a pre-camel. It was a dear little machine with an 80 horsepower dome. And as a flying machine, it was a sort of machine you would give to anybody and he couldn't hurt himself. It did everything you wanted it to do. It had no tricks and no vices. Sopwith went into receivership with the cut in military orders in 1918, but resumed as HG Hawker Engineering. The Hurricane is perhaps the most famous aircraft from Hawker Aircraft, a company formed in 1933. Such illustrious names as the Tomtit, Hart and Fury preceded the famous Hurricane, which helped win the Battle of Britain for the RAF. By the late 1940s, Hawker and Sopwith were heavily into jet development. This aircraft is the Hunter, and this is a two-seat version. 2,000 Hunters were built. Today, the latest single-seat fighter from the stable is the Hawk 200. This development from the famous Hawk trainer flown by the Red Arrows is a multi-role design which will accept advanced radar equipment for day, night or all-weather operations. And it can be armed with two 25mm Aden cannon and carry missiles or bombs. However, does Sir Thomas have a favourite aircraft? I find that a very difficult question to answer. Uh, it's rather like asking the father of a large family to pick out his favorite daughter. I think the Harrier is the, is the greatest jump, the greatest uh, stride in the development of all our aircraft. When it first flew, and I saw an airplane take off, climb, fly very fast, slow down, stop, and fly backwards and sideways, all under control. I reckon I'd seen everything. It's notable that so many of Sir Tommy Sopwith's great aircraft were privately funded in the first instance. The Camel, the Hurricane, the Harrier amongst them. All of which have played a decisive role in three very different types of air combat. Classic Harrier maneuver invented by John Farley as the airplane powers away from Bingham in a 60 degree climb. The pilot today, Lieutenant Commander David Morgan, DSC.
He's with number 899 Squadron based at Royal Naval Air Station Yeovilton, and he won that DSC in the Falklands. The Sea Harrier has been specially modified for maritime operations. It has no magnesium components in it and special anti-corrosion treatment. 57 of them have been ordered by the Navy for operation from Invincible class light aircraft carriers and the main visible differences between this and its land-based counterpart are redesigned raised cockpit and the replacement of the laser nose with a pointed radar housing the Blue Fox radar. his display to an end as he slows down now for a short landing, transitioning from purely wing-borne flight to partly engine-borne flight by adjusting the vector thrust from his Pegasus engine. display that was much appreciated by the large crowd of all ages here at Biggin Hill. This gentleman is Brendan O'Brien who's sitting in the back of his plane. He's about to do something quite remarkable. John, have you seen this act? I've seen it. I don't know where he got the idea from, but Brendan O'Brien has certainly been flying for a long time. He's been on the air show circuit for some 15 years. Started out with pit specials and doing the, the regular aerobatic sort of flying. However, he's now perfected this act, which involves his aircraft landing on top of the truck. And there's an interesting comparison. The Cub he's flying has got a 150 horsepower engine gives him a 100 mile an hour cruise and the truck has got a 420 horsepower engine to try and get it up to a speed where he can touch down but obviously he's not happy that looks very difficult he's not happy at all is he going to glue it on he's nearly there yeah no no he sometimes can't do it at the first attempt that's what oh. the truck driver sees or doesn't see if he gets the display smoke and he's going to go around for another attempt. There's good communication between Brendan and the driver. They're obviously talking to each other on the radio. And also, there's a monitor in the truck cab, accepting a feed from a camera mounted on top of the trailer so that the driver can see whether or not Brendan's managed to complete his landing. They're coming around for another go. I think Brendan himself uh, claims that it's about 90% sheer bottle to do this. I think there must be an awful lot of uh, guts involved in it. Plus a fair old spoonful of insanity, isn't it? I mean, what a daft way to try and <laughs> solve the problem of congestion at airfields. Just land on a truck. Here he goes. And that truck is really up to speed now. That's the view the driver gets. And he can see whether Brenda's going to make it. It's about eight foot wide there, and he hung a wheel off. I suppose he's in the back to try and get a better view as well as distribute the weight. And he's made it. I think he's there, and it's interesting to note he keeps that tail up. Yeah. It really is a great act from Brendan, and here is a truly marvellous act from British Airways. I don't think he's going to try and land that on the truck, is he, John? <laughs> I hope not. British Airways have recently stripped down one of their Concords, and it's reassuring to know that they've found no corrosion in the main structure, so the future for this wonderful aeroplane remains assured, at least until the early part of the next century. After the shattering roar of all those jet engines, the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight's Lancaster Bomber. As we celebrate 70 years of the Royal Air Force, the most poignant part of their history must surely remain the Battle of Britain and the great bomber raids of World War II. 
In recent years, aviation has made great strides, particularly in the field of computer technology, which has led to such developments as automatic landing capability and very precise navigation systems. The crews who operated this aircraft had no such luxuries. They set off on their missions, young men with an average age of little more than 20, with no autopilot, very basic instrumentation, and very little in the way of navigation aids. The fact that the Royal Air Force maintains this airplane in an operational condition must surely remain a most fitting tribute to those brave crews.